RFD TV's Rural Education Special is brought to you by the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. The idea is to have the world be healthy. Rural America is the backbone of our country and making sure that students from these areas can succeed is a priority for many. Hi, I'm Jack Ford from American Ed TV. More than half of all school districts and about a third of all public schools are located in rural areas. Well, I was lucky. I went to uh, amazing schools, K-12, through and went to a wonderful college. But I always talk about my high school English teacher, uh, Ms. McCampbell. And she's still alive today. I spent some time with her not too long ago. But in those days, we didn't have computers. So I turned in a paper in blue ink, and I'd get back more red ink from her than in blue. But she really taught me how to better express my ideas on paper how to articulate your point of view verbally. Um, in her class, there were no right or wrong ideas, but you had to be able to really think. And she pulled things out of me that I didn't know I had in myself. And I think that's what great teachers do. They see potential in kids that kids may not understand uh, in, their, in their own lives. So I had amazing, amazing teachers, but Mr. Campbell was at the top of that list. Um, this new school that we're at, I'm also the director of creativity and I lead professional development for 45 teachers every week. Um, so this is also coming from the perspective of the school administration um, that we need to invest in creativity and that sounds like a really simple thing like of course why who's anti-creativity that's ridiculous but seriously invest in creativity in time in resources creativity is the ultimate renewable resource like it breeds creativity breeds more creativity um, so the, my favorite example, you know, we started the Studio H program. Um, it's now at 8th through 12th grade. But I also discovered, and this is a great example of it breeding more creativity, these are some 6th grade girls that I ended up working with completely accidentally um, and I t in an advisory structure. And I took them up to our Studio H class and they're like, why can't we do this? Like someone give me a chainsaw, I want to do something. They're like this tall. And, and so I'm like, well why, you know, what? Why can't they? Like, I'm thinking that would be amazing. And there's something about the way girls come into the making space at an age where they're, they're being told, either consciously or subconsciously, that math is not for them. Um, this is about the age when most girls start saying, I hate math and I, I'm bad at it. As an artist and as a teacher, I feel that there is a responsibility to educate and help kids learn the value of art the value of creativity, the value of education, and also a way to view this world that we live in. And the arts do that. Creative arts helps children and, and adults as well see the world that we live in, interpret it, and become inspired by it. As an artist and as a teacher, I find when those two come together, it's so important that we educate our children, we inspire our children, and we instill in them the ideas that the world is full of inspiration. This world that we live in, every day can be a bright, inspiring day. We can be creative, we can be um, useful, we can gain confidence. All of these things come through the creative arts. And I think uh, education, creative arts, and our children's future, these are very important things that we like to strive and we like to educate and help with. And as a teacher of art, I find that nature appeals to children as well. And I think that children really feel connected and close to nature. I teach art and, and I do art. And when those two come together, I see that one of the most important things for kids today is the creative arts. It gives them experience. It gives them a way to interact with their world. It inspires them to do great things. I mean, these are all things that the creative arts do. The challenges facing rural and small town districts are very real and they're urgent. They do suffer from shrinking tax bases. Rural districts have struggled to recruit and retain great teachers. Yet with all that said, I reject the narrative that says that rural America cannot provide a rich and rigorous curriculum or compete for attention and funding. And I reject the idea that rural America cannot implement transformational reform. Not just about sharing education ideas, but community development, business enterprises, government. Today, the results are starting to come in, and they are absolutely at odds with much of the conventional narrative back in Washington. 
So let's finish this thing off by saying, what do we teach? Because it's not just me as a teacher. It's about the custodians. It's about the janitors. It's about the secretaries. It's about the district administration. It's all of us teaching together. What do we teach together? We teach the students of all backgrounds, of all abilities, to be successful no matter the circumstance. That's what we teach to students of all backgrounds, of all abilities, to be successful no matter the circumstance. If you are what you eat, you are what your eyes, ears, and heart consume. We are what we feed each other. We are thoughts and spirits forever rising anew. If you are what you eat, then you can be what you choose. The power to change your health, your life, your world lies only inside of you. Welcome to Creo Studio. So, what is Creo Studio? Creo Studio is a video-based creative arts program using the tablet to make new and creative ways to express yourself through art making. World-renowned artist and designer Paul Hamilton teaches you how to express yourself more creatively. And the Creo team teaches you all the tools you need to make meaningful art. Go to creostudio.org today and order yours now. Hi, my name is Paul Hamilton and I am an artist. Welcome to Orange Couch. What is Orange Couch? Orange Couch is a video-based creative arts program. This is not arts and crafts time. This is real art, real ideas. Every time you order Orange Couch, you're going to receive quality art materials to reach your creative goals. So everything you need is going to be right here and right here. Go to orangecouch.org today and order yours now. If you are what you eat, you are what your eyes, ears, and heart consume. We are what we feed each other. We are thoughts and spirits forever rising anew. If you are what you eat, then you can be what you choose. The power to change your health, your life, your world lies only inside of you. These rural school districts face challenges, including shrinking tax bases, funding inequities, limited access to college prep courses, inadequate technology infrastructure, and the outmigration of young people and professionals. Well, I think uh, I've spent my entire career in rural school districts, and coming in, I thought it was going to be very interesting to see how other school districts deal with the concerns and needs that they have in their local districts. And uh, coming out of it, uh, develop some great ideas, some collaborations, and, and the understanding that we're all, we all have similar issues and we're trying to solve them uh, in a variety of ways, um, but it's, it's interesting that collectively we've come up with some ideas that we can work for. I think economic development and, and job creation uh, have come out of this as, as huge factors in improving our educational process in the future. Also the advent of the use, I should say, an expansion of use of technology across the board, especially for rural districts such as us who have limited capacity in providing uh, specific coursework to our students. So being able to use technology to broaden those opportunities and then also collaborate with higher education for college readiness as well as well as the career readiness aspect. I think that's a main driver in being able to provide the services to our students that the larger school districts can. In Northwest Ohio uh, there, there was a great vision 15 years ago and we have um, tremendous access to uh, technology and networking. Uh, we have fiber uh, run in our ITC, the Northwest Ohio Computer Association, with that vision has given us the opportunities that I am finding out many school districts that are rural, uh, especially southeast Ohio, uh, that don't have that access. So obviously then they, they struggle to have those additional opportunities for their students to collaborate with higher ed and, and develop those, those relationships. So we're very fortunate, but at the same time, we need to find ways to expand those opportunities for our students and working with with uh, you know, colleges and, and uh, universities in our area to promote those programs. 
whatever your role, everybody's a leader, how do you encourage one another in that leadership role for the effective integration of technology? And so we had a town hall this morning where uh, Clark County Superintendent in, in uh, Las Vegas, uh, Pat Skorkowski was our keynoter, and then we had a fabulous uh, panel. And Dr. Wendy Drexler, who's our new Chief mm -hmm. Innovation Officer, uh, launched our Lead and Transform movement for ISTE, which includes some uh, uh, online resources and a diagnostic tool for site and district level folks to go in and uh, with reference to the ISTE standards and essential conditions, uh, get some immediate feedback about where am I, where is my district, where is my school in this process of integration. And it's a very practical tool, uh, readily available to members, and we're very excited. It's sort of the beginning of this uh, new level of service we're looking to provide. So, One thing I think that's really interesting, even my own experience in attending ISTE, is to see the growth and the diversity of the attendees. So talk a little bit about that for those that might not have experienced an ISTE yet, yeah, you know, I have to say, uh, it, the, the ISTE conference that has been built over many years by many people uh, is a phenomenally amazing, gigantic, passionate event. And they have, over years, I've only been here 22 months, so I give full credit to all those who came before me. Uh, they've created this really dynamic event, and there is a growing attendance. We're going to set records this year for attendance. Uh, a couple of days ago, we hit 14,000, and that was still with a couple of days to go before on-site reg. So we're looking at some pretty significant numbers, and we're, we're very excited. We've got people coming from all over the world, huge numbers of uh, global participants all over the country, all 50 states, um, and we're looking to, we're thinking we may hit 16,000 paid registrants. That's not counting speakers, exhibitors, sponsors, et cetera. So um, we're excited by, uh, there's something going on in the community. We are hitting that tipping point, and, and we're excited because after many years of you know, volunteer work by all the members of the ISTE community and a great staff over many, many years, um, we feel like there is this sort of the tipping point that we're reaching. And ISTE wants to reach and serve ever more people. So this is our, this is our premier event. We're very excited to network and connect and serve. And uh, we're just very excited. And I, and I get the sense, Brian, that when it comes to the attendees that maybe everybody's feeling so much more comfortable with technology. I think a few years back there was that fear that if I don't understand it, I'm afraid that I would get in a position with other people that maybe do understand it, but now there's more of an open dialogue. I, I think so, and I think part of what I talk about a lot is how we as adults in education, we want to create this environment for our students to uh, feel comfortable virtually or, or, or literally to raise their hand and ask for help. And I think what we're finding is that all of us as adults in this work of education, we're all over the map. If you are what you eat, you are what your eyes, ears, and heart consume. We are what we feed each other. We are thoughts and spirits forever rising anew. If you are what you eat, then you can be what you choose. The power to change your health, your life, your world lies only inside of you. Welcome to Creo Studio. So, what is Creo Studio? Creo Studio is a video-based creative arts program using the tablet to make new and creative ways to express yourself through art making. World-renowned artist and designer Paul Hamilton teaches you how to express yourself more creatively. And the Creo team teaches you all the tools you need to make meaningful art. Go to creostudio.org today and order yours now. Rural schools need to be globally competitive and locally relevant so that our children can excel in whatever they choose to pursue. What is your take on online learning? We know about MOOCs, these massive online offerings. You know, you hear behind the scenes about universities yeah. wondering, what is this going to do? Because like you're saying, yeah. they need to get the student into their, into their doors. What is your take on that blended environment where you go to a physical campus or you do everything completely online? Are we prepared for that as a society? Uh, not really. And I'm a great advocate for online learning. I think it offers all kinds of extraordinary opportunities to personalize education and to customize it. You know, kids now have access to pretty much any form of information, any sort of cultural traditions that they want. I mean, when I was at school, the, the curriculum was contained within the walls of the school, but now it's, it's genuinely global. So I think we're just in the nursery steps of figuring out how best to use the internet and digital technologies to enrich and enhance education. But I don't think that it, these technologies will or should replace you know, face-to-face -face learning. 
there's something to be got from being in the same room with people that you don't get from just being online with them. But it, it, so I don't see online learning replacing schools, but I really do think it'll help to transform them. Now, obviously, Sir, Rob Sir Robinson, those are technology companies that are building some amazing platforms. Yeah. How do we, as the general public, sift through big business and education, because they're really coming together in some transformative ways, mm -hmm. but then there are some, I'll leave that to you to, to, to share with me, your, your, <laughs> your thought on the role big business plays with technology and education. Well, I've spent a lot of time arguing for um, a, a broader understanding within business of the challenges that educators face. And also arguing to educators the importance of recognizing there is an economic agenda to education and uh, understanding how business works. Because it's for many kids, they, obviously, when they leave high school or go to college, they want to be ready for the job market. The irony is, just use the word again, is that the current system is, is in many ways stifling creativity, not, not because educators want to do that, but because of these external requirements. And at the same time, businesses say they want people who can be innovative and creative and think differently. And they're disappointed that kids who come to the education system often lack those very qualities. So there is a need for a, a, a better conversation between business and education. The other side of it, though, is that in many uh, contexts, business is seeing education as a potential profit center. And there are lots of evidence of that in the UK and here in America. And while nobody objects to business making profits, uh, education isn't quite that sort of business. It's not an industrial process. It's about people. And my concern is that a lot of these efforts to promote involvement in education uh, may mask at some level uh, political interest in breaking up the public school system to privatize it. And like public schools, there are some very good private initiatives and there are some pretty bad ones. But I'm not against businesses being involved in education, on the contrary. But they do need to be involved in the broader aims of education and not just be seen as another possible profit center. Are you seeing the academies in the UK succeeding? Because I know a lot of people here in America, they're just starting to understand what an academy is yeah. in, in England and looking at that from the charter side, right, that privatization. And yeah, I mean, many of them are very good. Uh, it's like there are charter schools in America, some of which are really brilliant. Uh, some of them aren't. It isn't about whether they're a charter school or not that makes them good. Uh, in many ways, the public school systems continue to outperform uh, many charter schools. Academies are neither good or bad in themselves. But the problem in the UK is that when um, uh, people establish an academy status, it, it's funded by the government but remains independent of some of the pressures that public schools face. And it's why I'm saying that the it's not just about structure, it's about purpose. And that's partly what I want to talk about today, you know, why are we doing this? And, and diversity is a good thing, but if the, uh, if the result of it is that we lose sight of the real purpose of education, then we have a problem. I want to close with this, Sir Robinson. I think it's fascinating and I think it's informative for both uh, educators here at ASCD in Los Angeles, but for kids to see how people like yourself has, have made it to where you are and the path that you've taken. Yeah. So go down the rabbit hole with me. Let's say that you and I are young chaps in Hyde Park playing football. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about what we want to do when we're older. What was your initial dream? And could you have ever imagined doing what you're doing now and consulting and working with you know, different, three different continents and, and, and education systems? And what was that initial dream? Well, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's a really critical point because I didn't have a big plan about what I was going to do. That wasn't when I was at school. I was thinking if it all goes really well, I'll be living in L.A. <laughs> and, and speak with the ACSD conference. <laughs> it's not like that. You create your life. You set a, a direction, you, you identify interests, and you're drawn to things which, uh, which appeal to you in some way. And I mean, you make sense of your life retrospectively when you come to write your resume. But looking forward, I didn't have this in mind, and most people didn't. You know, it's being alive is a creative process. Uh, having a life is a constant process of improvisation. It's why I think creativity should be at the heart of education uh, on the basis that we cannot predict the lives that people will take any more than people who are in education predict their own life very satisfactorily. So developing the core principles and processes 
of creativity is vital for, edu for education, it's vital for the economy, but it's also vital in people's personal lives so they can create a life that they want to lead. Well, we think that your, your message is vital and we're okay. excited that you're here to share that with everyone. It's been a real pleasure. OSU Extension is the outreach arm of the university and we do non-formal education for youth and adults throughout the state and so oftentimes we're not at the table when we talk about education and how we implement that throughout the state. Well I think uh, one of the things that I'm concerned with is our policies and and how our schools continue to work and and how we really focus on student learning and community-based needs and making sure that we allow school systems the leverage to decide really how they need to, to educate our, pe our young people and really, you know, not concentrate so much on teaching to the test, but teaching for success and lifelong learning and, and development of our communities. Uh, Mrs. Leggett was my art teacher in high school and she, she was probably one of my very favorite teachers. I never considered myself to be artistic, but certainly creative. And so I, I decided at that time that um, art wasn't something I wanted to have as my income making uh, or profession for life, but that it was always going to be a pursuit in, in my life for hobbies and other things that I like to do. But one of the things that she said to us every day is, being a temperamental artist isn't acceptable. If this is what you do as a profession, you have to be dedicated and work hard every single day and try to advance it. And whether you come in in the mood to be artistic or creative or not really doesn't matter. You still have to do your job. If you are what you eat, you are what your eyes, ears, and heart consume. We are what we feed each other. We are thoughts and spirits forever rising anew. If you are what you eat, then you can be what you choose. The power to change your health, your life, your world lies only inside of you. Hi, my name is Paul Hamilton and I am an artist. Welcome to Orange Couch. What is Orange Couch? Orange Couch is a video-based creative arts program. This is not arts and crafts time. This is real art, real ideas. Every time you order Orange Couch, you're gonna receive quality art materials to reach your creative goals. So everything you need is gonna be right here and right here. Go to orangecouch.org today and order yours now. I'm Dr. Rod Berger with the Corps of Education and American Ed TV here at ASCD 2014 in Los Angeles. We decided to ask people what their ideas in education were. Big, audacious education ideas. Here's what we found. This man needs no introduction. Obviously, a lot of you recognize him as Eric Scheniger, the, the digital principal here in the U.S. Uh, we see you at lots of conferences and really leading the way. I want to ask you, what is your big, audacious education idea? My big, audacious idea is not very complex. We need to work harder to create schools that work for kids as opposed to schools that work well for us. Too often schools are based on compliancy, control, and mistrust of students. We need to flip the script and really create schools that students want to be a part of, they find meaningful, relevant, because that is the key to preparing students to be successful in today's global economy. Education is a profession where we're all together in a school building, yet oftentimes we don't know what our colleagues are doing. So I think principals and teachers need to find ways to share great ideas from within. One practical tip, principals should start every faculty meeting with a short clip of teaching. That can come from a, a short videotape segment with the teacher's permission where the teacher leads the discussion and really shares out what's working. Instead of just focusing on the strands the students are struggling with, let's focus on what students are learning well at, what teachers are teaching effectively, and let's continue to build on the success from within the school. And as teacher leaders, let's find ways to do those peer observations in a non-evaluative way and learn from each other. It's very important that we learn and grow as educators. One idea that I have that would be a big, audacious uh, idea is for students to self-assess themselves. What we've learned in our district is when students have an opportunity to talk with one another and keep track of their own learning and they understand the why of why they're learning, they do better and they progress more. 
Well, it's all about passion. For me, it's educators modeling um, the behavior they wish to see in their kids. And I think if educators are really given the opportunity to pursue their passions and share those with the students, uh, I think the ideas flow. And again, it's about modeling the behavior. So modeling being a lifelong learner, pursuing your passions um, in tandem with what you're teaching in the class and pursuing those parallel paths and inspiring kids to own their learning as well. What is your big audacious education idea? I think we really need to work with teachers who are desirous of being leaders and build their capacity, whether they want to actually be a principal or whether they want to just lead the effort in curriculum or professional development, to provide them with the opportunity to get some time within their school day to really build that capacity within themselves. With more leaders in the schools, we can actually really affect more change. In America, poverty is never destiny, and neither is geography. So despite the conventional wisdom and skepticism back in Washington, the actual narrative of rural education is being rewritten by courageous education leaders. For American Ed TV, I'm Jack Ford. I'm absolutely optimistic about the future.